world's news in pictures, and this is Pathé Gazette screening it. Side story. This is the Paris which Francoise Rosé refused to look upon. Said Raoul, it's here in London that I see for the first time since its occupation my poor beloved Paris where I was born. Ah, these Germans. They come by train, they have come by air, by road. They are everywhere like water, like they set their mark on everything. They are strong, invincible, victorious, always. And here they are, at the same place where I have seen your victorious husbands and sons saluting in 1918 the grave of France's unknown soldier. He who lies there is a prisoner now. Poor Paris. Built for beauty, for grace, shaken today by the jackboot of the temporary conqueror. Yes, temporary. Out of this occupied Europe, there comes a thin trickle of victims. What can they tell us, these people of many nations? Here is one voice speaking after four years' silence, an American press correspondent, Ralph Heinzen. We're very glad to get home. We've been 13 months interned in Germany, and 13 bad months for the Germans as well as for ourselves, because in those 13 months, Germany has lost the war. They know they're whipped, but they're wondering how they're going to get out of it. Past year, Hitler has lost tremendously his prestige, particularly as a military leader. All through Europe, there's a very fierce underground warfare going on against Germany. In every occupied country of Europe, but particularly in France, there is this mighty organization of courageous patriots who are waging a war day and night against the forces of occupation. Freedom of speech is but one of the things denied in France. The press is gagged and told what to say. Again through the eyes of Hitler's cameras, we see how the Nazi overlords dictate their methods. Every detail is ruled by the Teutonic will. But the typesetters, the makeup men, the printers, though silent, are they subdued? Is there no defiance, no free voice, no means of telling the truth? No, see. Men at the peril of their lives bring the truth to their compatriots. It's the underground press, born in secret, carried in secret. The underground press is everywhere. These dull-witted bots, see how they try to tempt them with their crazy posters. If you would see France live, it says, fight against Bolshevism. The great French sense of humor finds a way to laugh and joke at the expense of the enemy. A clever twist to the words, and it becomes propaganda against the enemy. If you would see France live, fight the boss. In spite of persecution, torture, and the taking of hostages, the French have settled down to an obstinate fight to hamper the occupying forces and lay the foundation for their own freedom by sabotage. The skilled worker destroys that which was built with love, but which is now used by the enemy. And the young men who refuse to work for the Germans, fight for the Germans, go to the Maquis, the Maquis, the bush. They become the guerrilla fighters of the mountains. You see them in this film taken in France. It's the first of its kind to come out of occupied Europe. This is no ordinary museum. There is no attempt at any artistic presentation. It's poor quality. But the cameraman had no time to linger over the choice of angle or lighting. Nevertheless, I think it's an intensely moving picture. These brave young men gladly accepted the risk of being recognized in the hope that the presentation of this film might bring a little help to their comrades. Besides, 
to be seen with weapons, whatever they are, one rifle between six or ten men and maybe one machine gun doesn't add anything to their certainty of being shot if they are caught by the Nazis. Much has been said about the boys of the Maquis, often with admiration, but sometimes with doubt. What are these boys who are rebelliously living? Anarchists? Terrorists? I think the answer is to be found in the oath of allegiance which every man enrolled into the Maquis takes. Listen. Every man seeking admission to the army of the Maquis is not only a deporter from German deportation, but a volunteer partisan and an auxiliary soldier of the French army. He forfeits the right of communicating with his family or his friends until the end of the war. He will observe absolute secrecy as to his hiding place and the identity of his leaders and comrades. He knows that every violation of this rule is punishable by death. He knows that he cannot receive any assurance of regular pay and that even his food and weapons are not guaranteed. He will respect the life and property of French, allied or neutral citizens, not only because the Maquis depends for its existence on its good relations with the population, but also because the men of the Maquis form an elite, and because it is their duty to prove by their example that courage and honesty go together in all true Frenchmen. It goes without saying that no distinction of religion or politics is made among would-be recruits. All who are ready to fight the common enemy are welcome. A wounded man must never be abandoned. The dead must be taken away and buried whenever it is humanly possible to do so. The Maquis volunteer will not be armed until he has proved himself worthy by his toughness, training and discipline of receiving one of our rare and therefore precious weapons. The punishment for losing a weapon is death. The penalty is severe, but essential for the safety of all. Every man of the Maquis is an enemy of Marshal Pétain and the traitors who obey him. France lives and will live. Well, it seems to me, and I pray God that you feel as convinced as I do, that to their courage, to their suffering, should be paid a tribute of total faith in the future. Long live England, my friend, and vive la France. Here is the world's news in pictures, and this is Pathé Gazette screening it. RAF Lancasters of Bomber Command fly through a curtain of heavy flak to blast a Luftwaffe equipment depot at Saint-Cyr near Paris. One of the enemy's main centers supporting the German armies in the west is heavily hit by 4,000 pounders. Devastating attacks by Allied aircraft have far-reaching effects. Crippled communications force the Germans to turn more and more to the sea lanes round the coast of Europe. And that's where Coastal Command comes in. A bowfighter striking force launches a determined assault on enemy shipping off Heligoland. Torpedo-carrying aircraft with heavily armed bowfighters smash up one of the largest convoys attacked since the war began, about 40 enemy vessels. Our planes met heavy opposition which included parachute projectiles with their trailing cables suspended in midair. But here you have a really magnificent picture of how the torpedo attack was pressed home. The spiky lines on the film should be ignored. They're caused by an electrical discharge produced by prevailing weather conditions.
bow fighters head for base. One of the planes came in to land, trailing 50 yards of steel cable, a souvenir parachute rocket. A great day for Coastal Command, and heightened by the fact that none of its aircraft was lost. The original bridges over the River Orne having been destroyed, two new ones were built by engineers who named them respectively Winston and Churchill. A continual stream of tanks and vehicles of all kinds pours over the bridges all day long. This is as good a time as any to pay tribute to the Royal Engineers whose invaluable work deserves the highest praise. It's the airfield construction group of the Royal Engineers which is given the job of removing a ruined village. This is all that is left of Tilly, once so much in the news. When demolition is complete, the village will be wiped entirely from the map. An open space will be left upon which to build afresh. The last villagers drive quietly away. Frontline feeding is often a matter of snatching a meal when opportunity offers. During a lull in the fighting, British troops stoke up, many of them squatting in their slit trenches, ready at a moment's notice to drop a mess tin and pick up a rifle. The cigarette and sweet ration always goes down well. Snowball, a village cat, makes friends in a machine gun pit. To him, Private Connell's trigger finger is itching to be scratched. German multi-barreled rocket artillery on the Russian front. Yet the Nazis are on the run in spite of this fantasy of violence. These are captured German newsreel pictures showing batteries of sobbing sisters, as the Russians nicknamed them, hurling their rocket shells into the Soviet lines. Germans claim that these weapons have brought a new frightfulness to warfare. True that the future of jet and rocket propulsion holds out tremendous and even fearful possibilities. But let's turn to an infinitely more pleasant form of projection. American playgrounds have a secret weapon for entertainment, a cannon that shoots out women. Boy, with ammunition like that, the war would be over. A hundred and sixty feet from gun mouth to landing net. Slow motion shows the feminine gun fodder doing her graceful somersault. Come back, lady, and do it again. Steady job for a dainty charge of dynamite, yet every day she gets fired. The port of Civitavecchia blocked by wrecked ships. The Nazis blew up everything they could to make the harbour useless. So now the Allies are clearing the dock area, engineering with a bang. laying by bulldozer. A section of line replacing a blown-up track is pushed into place. The new line carries its first load, a captured German coastal gun. Civitavecchia, most important harbour of Rome, is working again for the Allies. With bombs to hurl and guns to fire, P-47 Thunderbolts do a double job. They take off from a flying field in Italy to strike as fighters and bombers, a weaving pattern of planes.
the peel-off to bomb and shoot up a strategic highway. The job of bombing done, the Thunderbolts use their guns. Strathing attacks behind the German lines leave a trail of disrupted transport and blazing dumps. Another communique will tell us with masterly understatement that fires were started. Here is the world's news in, and this is Pathé Gazette screening it. HMS Rodney, gallant veteran of many campaigns, goes out to bombard the German-held Channel Island of Alderman. Our convoys crossing to Cherbourg might be menaced by enemy guns on the island, so Rodney's job is to silence those guns. These pictures, taken by Pathé Gazette cameraman Jock Gammel aboard an escorting destroyer, show the men taking up action stations. The gun crews are looking forward to having another smack at Jerry, as with throbbing engines the huge battleship churns her way forward. Down into the bows, well below the waterline, we go to show you how the great guns are loaded. The German batteries on Alderney are due to receive 75 rounds of those giant one-ton shells, by which time they won't have much nuisance value left. Three days before the present action, the Rodney set out for her target, but she was turned back because visibility was so good that the German anti-aircraft guns on the island might have caused trouble to the RAF spotter plane. Now she is returning to the attack, carrying a load of destruction. In a second or two, you will have a chance of seeing the actual loading of the guns take place. The breach is opened, the cage ascends, and in goes the shell. The gun crews are ready, the target has come within range, and the signal is given to fire. And just ahead is the Cherbourg Peninsula. Rodney's 16-inch guns are firing right over it to the German-held island about 17 miles away. The first shot landed 300 yards from the target. After that, the shells dropped just where they were needed. There won't be much more trouble from the German guns on Alderney. Here's all that was left of Falaise when Canadians entered it after the bitterest fighting in Normandy. The chateau still holds that of its snipers until one of our tanks sends in a few 75mm shells. With that bit of trouble cleared away, troops press on into the town, if it can still be called a town. A spot of bother. Troops have to sprint for it to avoid another sniper's net. Yes, there are still fanatical Nazis holding out in the ruined town, sworn to die for their Führer amid the smoke and flame and crashing buildings. A bulldozer makes a road through the rubble to let the Allied armor pass. This is total war, which spares nothing in its path, homes, monuments, or churches. Through the desolate, ruined streets trudge those lucky Germans who, dodging the machine guns of their own SS men, have given themselves up as prisoners. Back come the inhabitants of Falaise to what is left of the town. Their worldly possessions have gone. Yet there is hope in their faces, for they are free again. The Battle of Falaise is over. The crushed enemy left behind in the pocket is being wiped out. And what little of von Kluger's armor has managed to escape eastward is torn to shreds by Allied aircraft as it makes a last desperate dash towards the same. The 
tremendous news that large Allied forces had been landed under naval escort on the south coast of France came just as we learned that the German army in the north had been knocked groggy. First pictures to be rushed back to this country show the new invasion getting underway. Spirits are high as the troops taking part in this great venture are given their orders before zero hour. More than 800 Allied ships are on their way to the Riviera coast. Equipment and weapons are given a last polish in readiness for the assault. Aeroplanes tow hundreds of gliders carrying picked troops to be dropped at key points behind the enemy's coastal defences. The glider is not dragging its aeroplane backwards. The plane from which these pictures are being taken is moving faster than the rest. The gliders cross the coast without any opposition from the enemy. Soon the men inside them will be touching down on the soil of France. Zero hour. The Navy's guns open up to silence the German shore batteries and so stop them from interfering with the Allied landing. The bombardment is well on the target and many of the Nazi coast defences are knocked out. Supporting aircraft provide the eyes of the invasion forces as the landing craft make their way towards the shore. It won't be long now. troops to land had been dropped by parachute shortly before dawn. These pictures illustrate the work of these paratroops. More than a thousand of them were in the air at the time. Here's one of the strangest stories of the war. Many times have we heard of enemy troops coming into our lines to give themselves up, but these two couldn't wait for that. They are next to dinghy, rowed out to our ships and asked to be taken prisoner. lays down a heavy smoke screen to cover the assault troops as they prepare to go in. At last, the Riviera beaches crunch under the bows of our landing craft as the first wave of assault troops goes ashore. Opposition is lighter than the Allied commanders had dared to hope, and in record time, a beachhead is firmly established. The Allied forces strike inland, and soon the first haul of prisoners comes in, 700 in the first few hours. As we go to print, the total of prisoners has risen to 14,000, and the Allied forces have reached 60 miles inland. Things are moving fast, too fast for the bewildered German high command. news in pictures, and this is Pathé Gazette screening it. The year is 1942, and Paris is in chains. This amazing document was filmed with infinite daring by our newsreel cameraman Gaston Madrou. To fool the Gestapo, he concealed his camera inside a basket carried in front of his bicycle and covered it carefully with empty wine and cognac bottles. He would mix with thousands of Parisian cyclists, ready to capture these pictures, which draw aside the curtain that hid Paris in the days of its German occupation. A slight tug on a hidden cord as he cycled around Paris, and his automatic camera recorded the amazing sights and scenes we are screening today. In the boulevards are offices of the Turt organization, which runs the slave labor camps in Germany, and a cinema proclaiming itself for German soldiers only. And always for the hungry Parisians, there are the bread queues. Imagine yourself at the famous Longchamp races beside Gaston Madrou with his hidden camera. When he no longer had his bicycle as cover, he invented other daring ways of getting pictures like this. Note the stiff correctness of German officers among the fashionable throng in the paddock. 
the notorious collaborator de Brignon, French ambassador, attends a German ceremony at the Invalide Palace in 1943. Also present among the German and French officers were the equally notorious fascist Marcel Deyer and the Comte de Chambrun, Laval's son-in-law, now reported under arrest. Here are some of the wounded and repatriated prisoners of war whom the Nazis exchanged for workers pressed into German industry. A pitifully small proportion of those still held in the Reich as hostages and slaves. Meager details are available to accompany many of these pictures. This is believed to be the city hall, where the first ceremony of the so-called French Third Republic is being held. The brazen swastikas show just how French that republic was. The hated Laval, returning from Germany after getting orders from his Nazi bosses, arrives at the Gare du Nord with the German minister. Many times has Laval been likened to a rat or a toad. Both are equally applicable. From a man of shame to a symbol of shame, the Germans with true Nazi effrontery paraded the tomb of France's unknown warrior at the Arc de Triomphe. This was in 1942, when the Germans were still feeling pretty sure of themselves. But this final indignity is too much for the ordinary Parisians, and disturbances break out. At other ceremonies, Laval militiamen and similar units modeled on Hitler's Gestapo are to be seen. The pro-Nazi clique in Paris cling closely to their masters. Another sample of Madru daring. Remember the highly destructive RAF raid on the Renault Works in March 1942? He takes us right in to the blazing factories. Here's Madru still recording history in his own ingenious way. But now it is the Paris of 1944 and the German troops he is trailing are on the move. Signposts in German appear to Cherbourg and the Normandy front. It's the beginning of the great exodus forced upon the Bosch by Allied successes. And as the liberating troops draw nearer, the speed of that exodus increases every hour. movement of Paris comes out into the open. Posters appear, signed Paris Committee of Liberation. And soon from their hiding places, long treasured flags appear in the streets. Where Madru leaves off, other newsreel cameras take up the thread. Though we have witnessed similar scenes in earlier editions of our newsreel, Paris's hours of liberation demand a place in this story. These pictures are history, and we know we are satisfying a public demand in showing them. The Nazis have one more sting left, and street fighting flares up.
comparatively short-lived term of street fighting was largely due to the firmness with which the danger was met. When the citizens cheered with joy and relief, they knew that the Paris of Nazi rule had gone forever. pictures, and this is Pathé Gazette screening it. General Simpson's 9th Army GIs buckle on lifebelts as they get ready for the hazardous job of bridging the fast-flowing River Ruhr, the biggest natural obstacle barring the way to the Rhine. An unusually short and intense barrage, it lasted only three quarters of an hour, swept the assault area with unprecedented thoroughness. All roads to the Ruhr River lead through ruins. The use of smoke is a feature of General Simpson's tactics in this operation. Artificial fog screens engineer squads and assault troops as effectively as the news blackout which descended over the first days of the offensive. Lorry-borne pontoons lumber like grounded barrage balloons to the water's edge. Bridging a river of this width, running a four-knot current and within range of enemy guns is a tough assignment. Beneath the water, the enemy puts stakes, wire and floating mines. Marshal Montgomery describes the river crossing as a determined breakthrough attempt. Enemy shell fire and a difficult river were not enough to check it. The RAF's part in the softening up of Germany reaches a new high pitch of intensity in the burning and blasting of Forsheim, a small but important centre for the manufacture of precision instruments, shell fuses and similar essentials. time had never been attacked before. It looks as if it won't need to be attacked again. West and East came together in Egypt when President Roosevelt and Mr. Churchill, on their way home from Yalta, met in new conferences. First to arrive is King Farouk, Egypt's 24-year-old ruler, welcomed aboard an American destroyer by Mr. Roosevelt and his daughter, Mrs. John Bertica. The earlier talks were brief and carried through without ceremony in the Western manner. Next visitor to call on the President is the Emperor of Ethiopia, Haile Selassie, Lion of Judah and descendant of the Queen of Sheba. He has not forgotten his country's war with Mussolini and realizes the strength that lies in international unity. A series of independent conferences was also held by Mr. Churchill at the Auberge du Lac. 40 miles from Cairo. Here, the PM met Ibn Saud, King of Arabia, father of 60 sons, whose romantic rise to power has already passed into the rich legends of the desert. Behind him stands his famous dagger guard of Arabs who never leave his person. This is the first time Ibn Saud has left Arabia. The American destroyer which brought him to Cairo had a huge desert tent erected on its carpeted deck. This meeting, conforming to the ancient and unchanging precepts of Arab ritual, lasted several hours. Even leave-taking becomes a ceremonial. Meetings with King Farouk and members of his government completed the British round of conferences. Most important of these was held at the Egyptian Council of Ministers' offices in Cairo, attended by Mr. Eden, Lord Killeon, and Sir Alexander Kadagan. A few days after these pictures were taken, and immediately following his proclamation of Egypt's declaration of war against Germany, Ahmed Mayor Pasha, wearing the fez, was murdered by an assassin. The only sad note in these magnificently hopeful meetings.
The American drive into Luzon was no mere parade to Manila. The Japs had not wasted their many months of occupation, and the invading rangers have to smash in the hard way. The objective, fiercely defended to the last, is taken, a stage nearer Manila. Luzon has revealed plenty of evidence of the brutish animal rule of Japan. Picked American rangers penetrated the Japanese line and swooped down on an enemy prisoner of war camp, where they freed 513 servicemen, most of whom had been in Japanese hands for three years. Rescued in a night surprise, victims of Jap maltreatment have a long trek to make. Some are survivors of Singapore and most know what that death march from Bataan meant. Now they've had food and half-forgotten luxuries like cigarettes and chewing gum. Best of all, they're going home. Here are two men out of that Japanese black hole at Cabinet Town. The last two years has been nothing but hell. One of the saddest days of my life was when I was taken prisoner. And the happiest day was when I was liberated by the Rangers. Now Sergeant Robert Bell of Gray Street, Burnley, captured at Singapore while serving with the Manchester Regiment. I'm a Britisher that was liberated from that prison camp. I was taken prisoner in Singapore, from where I was sent to Thailand and compelled to help build a railway, during which time at least 50% of the people that were sent there died of cholera, dysentery, diphtheria and malnutrition. From Thailand, I returned to Singapore and was embarked on board a Japanese ship which was to take us to Japan. Off the coast of Luzon, this ship was sunk by American dive bombers. Of the 1,300 aboard, to my knowledge, only 70 of us survived. From there, at the similar shore, I was taken to this prison camp number one and I was liberated by the Yanks when they came in. I'm glad to be back in civilization again. Behind them are three dead years. The bodies of these men will never really lose the mark of Japanese brutality. Neither must our memories.